but you work on microplastics, things that are unseen and kind of unquantifiable. So you, can you break it down from the top? What is uh, chemical pollution from plastics, especially on the micro side? And how does this work, this microscopic stuff? Does it fall off of little household items and plastic bottles or just give us a big overview? Uh, I'll be happy to do that. And I may go back to that paper about these PFAS because mm -hmm. that is a first starting point that shows what is what's going on. In that paper, we summarized findings of different measurements of these PFAS chemicals in rainwater from around the world. And that was shocking to many people that these chemicals are in the rainwater everywhere in the world. And they are not just there, but they are there at levels that may even exceed what's now a health advisory. So they may actually be of concern. So what we find here is chemicals that are present everywhere, everyone is exposed to them, and they may that may be of a, a health concern. So I graduated college with a 3.7 GPA, um, but I got C's in every chemistry class I took. So please help me out here. Uh, it's not my strong suit. How would PFAS or any other chemicals get into the rainwater? Do they evaporate um, with water from really there? So they're that small and they go with the water. Yeah, exactly. These chemicals and many other chemicals that we have to see to cover in this broad problem of chemical pollution, these chemicals stay out gas from the materials they are used in. So PFAS are water repellent and oil repellent. They are used as impregnation uh, agents for textiles, for outdoor clothing, for protective um, garments, and uh, and for for many, many uses of uh, articles that people have in their hands every day. But they don't just stick to that surface, but they, as I said, outgas. And then they start a long journey. They travel with air, with wind, they are deposited with the rain, they get into the soil, they get into the water, they move with ocean currents. So they really have a long journey ahead of them. And because these chemicals have a special aspect or special property, they are super stable. So they have a lot of time to travel. And that's why, why they get everywhere in the world. But the basic mechanism is really they outgas and they start their journey and they go around, they circulate in all media. We call them multimedia chemicals, air, water, soil, vegetation, food, drinking water. And they go back, come back into our bodies. Um, my understanding is that these plastic jugs last seven to 800 years before degrading, but then what they degrade into probably lasts even longer. How long do these PFAS last uh, and what do they eventually degrade into? That is exactly the problem and also what caused the big splash. These materials, these chemicals don't degrade into anything in, in the environment. They will never go away. The ever? Only way for them, ever. Yes, that is shocking, isn't it? I didn't know that. Yeah. The only way for them to go, that the levels could go down is that the chemicals dissolve and dilute or dilute in the deeper oceans because that's a lot of water that can take up a lot of chemicals, but they still won't go away. They will just go from where we are here, from our immediate environment into the deeper water. And what will happen in the deeper water over centuries and millennia? We don't not know. Not much. Okay. Yeah, and that's, it's cool and dark there. there are not, nothing is going to happen really to them down there. So that's, that's the shocking thing. And that comes from the fluorine carbon bond. That these chemicals that contain fluorine bonded to carbon. And they have a chain of carbon atoms where fluorines are attached. And that part, this fluorinated chain makes them so special because this fluorinated chain does not interact with anything. It's water repellent, it's oil repellent, and that makes them so strong impregnation agents. It also makes them lubricants because they're not sticky at all. They make things glide easier. So they are, for example, used in ski racks to make skis glide faster. But of course, that is kind of crazy, really, because then, of course, they go out into the snow and uh, again start their journey circulating in the environment. So I think ski wax is a totally irresponsible application of these chemicals. 
So what percent of our products have these sorts of chemicals or related chemicals in them? Yeah, that's why I want to start from them, because they form a certain group and they have th th this, is this very special group and they are about 5,000 chemicals of that type, more or less. Overall, there are more than tens of thousands. I think it's 300,000 chemicals that are on the market commercially, globally. So many, many more than these PFAS. Of course, they have different properties. They don't. They are not as extreme, but they are. They have all kinds of properties. They may degrade easily. They may also be persistent, like PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls. They may be very toxic. They may be less toxic. Whatever. But overall, there is a soup of chemicals that uh, is that are circulating around us and also within us. And I think that is now the answer to your question, what is chemical pollution about? It's really about that messy soup of so many chemicals that we don't even, that we can't really control. And can't see and can't feel uh, in, right. in the short run. Oh my gosh. Right. That is, that is the, the, we are, you have often said that we are energy blind, but of course we are also chemicals blind, which is natural. <laughs> Because we use we're, them we're externality small. blind, my friend. Yeah, but also here it, it it fits exactly. It's this kind of blindness. Of course, it's not just physical blindness, but it's also mental externality blindness. I agree. 